of our countdown. Oh, hey, we didn't right. do the countdown. Woo! I'm not no sure countdown, why the countdown okay? Didn't happen. That's okay. <laughs> we don't always have to have that countdown that makes me want to dance. No, oh, I know. We were singing I it anyway. It. <laughs> so, Lori now, is our brave cruise director tonight. Yes, if we had a little bit of a tr uh, trouble getting on live, but welcome well, everybody. Um, I introduce myself. Um, my name is Lori Bellinger, and I am taking over today for Dara. She has some uh, internet issues and connection. Um, so, welcome. We have here Jennifer and Chrissy as well joining us live. Um, so if you can give us, give Facebook or the users permission for your name, we would love to see you and your comments as well. Um, this month we will be talking about developmental stages for uh, beginning a good grooming for puppies, dogs, and um, you know the older guys here. So the developmental stage is so important. When it, it comes is. to um, getting a dog, learning how to groom, um, learning to be okay with the grooming. And I, know I ask it, it's the first thing I ask every client, how old is your dog? Yep. Yep. That tells you a whole, whole, whole lot. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I completely agree. One of the biggest things um, is being able to create a bond with that uh, dog, whether it's a puppy or an older dog, but the first time grooming is so important. Um but yes, thank you for uh, joining us today. And, and let me just do Dara's normal little introduction. Um, this is the Whole Pet Academy's um, a Groomer's Cut show. And Dara Furlier, our host, I love what you said. She is having internet problems indeed. Yes. She is yes. sans internet. Um, <laughs> and I know they're moving into a new place, more rural. I know they're working on getting some high-speed business hookups for it. So um, good, good for her. And thank you, Lori, for taking over. Um, and we're supposed to tell people that if you're on Facebook to allow StreamYard to see who you are, otherwise to allow, allow them to know who you are. Otherwise, all we see in the comment section is Facebook user. Right. Uh, and we can't yeah. really tell, you know, we, we always talk to people in the chat room. Unless, saying, you, unless you comment and say, you know, Chrissy here, <laughs> which the you problem know, is that even if, if you're, you're Chrissy here, you're there could be three <laughs> Facebook users, and then we don't know which one is which that is making the. Um, yeah, so Dara's asking, is everything all set? And yes, we seem to be on. Yeah, great. So okay, uh, um, so but if, if everybody can please allow you know, and please join us in the chat room, um, and we are on what is it nine platforms? Yes, um, we're so on nine that's, platforms. That's always really yes. Great. Um, and I, you know, I, I wanted to start off the developmental psychology thing, and I can't imagine a better person than Chrissy Newmar Smith, boy, to have this conversation with. Um, but I have, you know, something most groomers probably don't have, which is a master's degree in developmental psychology and educational psychology for humans. And one of the things that, as I began to learn more about developmental psychology for dogs, I mean, I actually had been in dogs you know, already for decades when I, you know, was finishing my master's, I got my master's finished, I guess, in, you know, the mid nineties. And I'd been already showing dogs for like 15 years and breeding. And one of the things that really did surprise me is how many of the developmental tasks mm -hmm. and the developmental stages, they're not exactly the same. There are some exactly. parallels. There's there are a some lot. similarities. There's yeah. a lot of really um, interesting parallels between so, human developmental psychology and dogs. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So I was going to suggest that we start off talking about puppies with before they're even born, because yep. I think that for a lot of us, um, if you're if you're not a trainer or a breeder, you might not realize that um, they aren't necessarily a blank slate. That the right. the amount of stress that the mother is under while she is pregnant and while she is nursing can definitely affect puppies. It affects their nervous system while they're developing, um, and it affects how they respond to things. Like once they're born and they're nursing, and the, you know, if mom is always scared, they're learning that. So. Um, sometimes people think, well, they're all blank slates and, you know, you bring them home at eight weeks and it's, it's just up right. to you to make them a great puppy, but that's not really the whole picture. Absolutely. Certainly you are doing as best you can, <laughs> but I right, think that right. sometimes we forget that, that birth part and like mm -hmm. the mama that's pregnant. Cause there are a lot of dogs and rescues that are, are, um, you know, being fostered out while they're pregnant and they have their puppies and they're doing right. a wonderful job with it, you know, but others that, are under a tremendous amount of stress while they have their puppies. And some of those puppies have some, some problems because of that. 
And I want to say to, to even take what you were saying, Chrissy, one step further. And, and by the way, hi to Sydney in the in the chat room. That's a great comment, Sydney, about um, seeing how nice it is to have a puppy that is comfortable with grooming and not scared and didn't flinch and the dryer and all that kind of stuff. And I think you're right. The dryers are a really big challenge for us. Hi, but Sydney. I actually want to add to what Chrissy said. Mm -hmm. Not only is it about things that happen in utero and during the weaning and nursing process and the birth traumas and all the other things that can affect every part of development, same thing for people, but there's also genetics. So that let me just, um, well, miss you too, Sydney. Thank you. Bless you. <laughs> Um, we, Sydney was on the floor with us as a student. Yay! She was fabulous. Yeah. Awesome. Lucky. Yeah. I can't wait. I'm so excited <laughs> about coming to Intergroom to speak at the end of this month. And actually, it's the first uh, into the first couple of days of April. I'm yeah. finally, I'm hoping, going to drive up and see you, Lori, at the school. Yes, Yay. I love that. I'm, I'm, I, well, I'll be in my car. I'm driving from Chicago to New York just so that I can then hop in my car. I have a girlfriend in, in Vermont I'm going to go see on the way home. And I'm, I'm you know, I'm going to drive straight from Intergroom up to, you know, to the school and I'm going to spend at least a day there. So I'm really excited about finally getting to the school. Oh, I know. Awesome. I've never been. I'm really to, excited. If you want to stay at my place, you can. Oh, are you close Please. to the school? I, I work at the school two days a week, so I'm close enough that I commute there. Excellent. Yeah. I, I, I will take you up on that. So, uh, because <laughs> right. I think so because Sarah's not there them. anymore. Yes, yes. Right? So, <laughs> but anyway, back, back to the, ranch. <laughs> the, other, the other issue is, so, so the, again, this is, applies to people as well. Um, the way that the, psych, the psych, psychology, developmental psychology, the way that we develop is always a combination of genetics and environment. So there is this nature, nurture, um, how much of it you inherit from biological um, programming that comes from your parents and random mutations that can occur even with that. Like just take, for example, one litter of puppies. Let's say you've got six puppies in a litter. You might have one that's super aggressive, one that is super shy, one, one that, that is curious. Going one that's more of a cuddle bug. Um, you know, you might have one that's, uh, you know, a little slow and one that's super smart. You know, you can get in a litter, just like when you have children, um, you know, if you have multiple children, you know, they're not the same, even though they come from the same biological parents. So uh, it, there's always that nature and nurture. So you have to know right off the bat, that there are personality types that are sort of endemic um, to even something that you can't control. It's not about training. It's not about socialization. It's about something that's natural to that puppy's personality. So everything that we say tonight is has got to be taken in the context of you're working with the dog that's there in front of you and all of those things that went together to make that dog. And you can't change you can't change infrastructural personality types and proclivities. You can't change that. You can right, change right. and do all sorts well, of... And um, when we yeah. talk about puppies, I think also as groomers, we're seeing them hopefully very young, but perhaps right. not. But puppies are, are defined as birth to six months. Right. So sometimes we're even not even though the dog food companies on television <laughs> want to make you I just I think people I just have to comment on this. I'm sorry. The dog food companies put out like a long time ago, put out this, you know, puppy chow for a full year till he's full grown, you know, that thing. <laughs> um, because they're trying to sell you a higher price food that really they don't need to have that differentiated food when they get to be over six months of age. Yeah. Um, it really well, but, I mean, even the, the, the birth to six months. Yeah. But even the birth to six months, of course, is going to vary due to um, what breed they are. I mean, right. we know that some breeds live longer than others, mature right. faster, mature differently. And so when you're talking about nature and nurture, uh -huh. I mean, nature is part of our breed groups. You know, right. a border collie puppy is going to act differently than a chihuahua puppy that's going right. to act differently than a lab puppy and right. different than their own litter mates, too. Um, but really that like the six AKC's, months is interesting. 
Yeah, the, the, the AKC has just for everybody to know a resource that you can actually use. You go to akc.org. Every single breed of dog, it will actually tell you what the puppy issues are for that breed. Like we just got a poopy puppy <laughs> in before I found out that it's really noisy. And I got this neighbor that's now working quietly from home. And, you know, so there's um, it's a... Um, Sydney, you're right. Puppies are also a product of their environment and environments can change and all everything. It's always this blend between the nature and the nurture. Um, yes. So um, it, don't expect your puppy to be somebody he's not. Right. And but help him be the best puppy he can be. The larger the dog is, the slower the development is. OK, the physiological development for a large breed dog takes about six to nine months longer, depending if they're a giant breed, it could take up to a year to a year and a half longer before they are fully physically grown. So part of the calculation is when do they start puberty? So that zero to six months, that might yeah, be- It, it average, varies a lot. Yeah, right. yeah. If it's a smaller and, breed, they are gonna be starting puberty or at around that six months. But if it's a larger breed, they could be three to another six to another, if they're a giant breed, another nine months away before they're going to be starting puberty. So puberty is sort of officially the end of puppyhood. So it could be kind of, and that's biological because then the body is going through the adult changes physiologically. Um, and the coat is changing. Um, and that is, um, so all of those things have well, to be. But to circle back to puppyhood. Because we're going to cover our adolescence next week. Yep. <laughs> There's so much to talk about with puppies, I know. And we are all so enthusiastic about it. <laughs> so That's cool. When, um, when we talk about the babies, though, there are a couple of things that we should be aware of that tend to be trends across the board. Um, one of those is that their earliest experiences leave an impression. So mm -hmm. it's really important for us when they're really young to make sure that the puppy is always set up to be successful and to have a good time and to, to really make that the forefront of what we're doing and not worry about getting the nails perfect or not worry exactly. about getting the bum trimmed perfect, yep. that we can set the stage for their entire life because they are learning sponges. They're, yep. they're set up to believe that what I experience at this stage in my life is what I have to be prepared for forever. And so similarly, really we want to avoid any traumas or crises that will yeah. put an imprint on them that will be a problem for their life as well. Absolutely. So but that early so socialization important. period um, usually ends at about like 16 weeks. That's a critical socialization stage. You're not, you know, the, the, it's not that you can't socialize a puppy after that, but that stage is so perfectly primed the trainers refer to it as that socialization stage is referring to it as vaccinating for future behavior problems. So we do, during we, those we early do an eight weeks, to 16 week pu puppy program just yeah. for that. And we have to spend time explaining to the, to the parents who come in with their little floofy thing and they're like, okay, first haircut. I'm like, no, this nope. is not this eight to 16 weeks program. We have a four visits uh, I'll take them up to as late as 13 weeks, but four visits are spread out over several weeks. But I usually try to start them, you know, before 10 weeks if possible. And and four visits for a hundred bucks, I make it dirt cheap, but it is, and we spend a lot of time with them, but it is not about grooming. There's no, barely no. any grooming at all. It's all nope. about smells and sounds and yep. confident experiences, remembering the same thing as you would do with an infant human. Where zero to two, you're bonding to that. You're you're teaching them that they can trust. Trust mm -hmm. is yeah. the yeah. first developmental skill. It is the first developmental skill. They have to learn to bond to people and trust us. And so we cannot. Make and they need stress. variety during that time. Mm -hmm. yes. As much as we can. And I know. Um, you know, because we're groomers and we see them in a different way than trainers do. Because I wear both hats. You know. Um, mm -hmm. But sometimes we're like really worried about the vaccine history, you know, and but with our puppies, we need to kind of wave that a little bit. If they are not able to have a vaccine yet, it's so important for them to get the socialization and the experience Absolutely. that we need to adjust and say, how can I safely make sure this puppy isn't around other dogs 
and and adjust for that or or do whatever we need to do. So Chrissy, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Because I actually am going by what a, a vet and another breeder have told me, which is that a puppy does actually, and I got this in a puppy developmental training class, that a puppy who has nursed off of a vaccinated mother is generally pretty safe to be around other vaccinated adult dogs. For what and I understand, saying, that's the current I'm science. Saying, that they've in direct close contact, but it, they could be in the same room pretty safely. From and what I understand, that's that's the current the current thought on that and the current science is that they have some sort of lingering immunity from their mom, but some really of the that's antibodies. super safe. Yep. Yeah. And then we also, to be by the time about it, they can get but their we shouldn't first... be waiting until they have like their vaccines at four months. At, you that's know? crazy. And I know, I know that people happens like, well, I couldn't come in because mm -hmm. I hadn't had rabies yet. That is not. I told them it's not an issue. The the rabies is actually the one thing that they probably do retain some immunity for for several months. But all of the other things, the distemper, parvo combination things, that can all happen starting at nine weeks. Once they've had one of those. I, I'll take them any time after if they've been nursing on a vaccinated mom or have had that first round of puppy shots, they're they're good to go. And I've had many vets tell me that um, you don't want to, you know, expose them to rabies yet. But they're, you know, of course, rabies is for anybody to rabies. <laughs> Let's right, not expose them to rabies anyway. <laughs> from the world, I wouldn't let a baby puppy run loose in the woods or something. But um, rabies know, is it's not. Good. Yeah. Yeah. No, actually, it's it's still out there. In fact, I know. Um, about well, two years ago, there was a skunk on my street. Dogs. Yeah. That we that we was walking around, stumbling around during the oh, day really? that we were able to uh, trap. Yeah. Well, it depends yeah. on how rural no, you live. No. I guess. Now let let me ask some of the city. users out. <laughs> let me ask some of the yeah. users out here because I would like to get everyone's feedback and maybe have tips and tricks. What do you guys like to do when you have your first time puppies? How do you get them used to the environment and the grooming salon? Um, I know a little similar to Jen, what we do are puppy packages. And exactly like Chrissy says, it's not about neatness. It's not about getting those nails short and smooth. It's about getting them used to the grooming process because we have to, which is my favorite quote, get them used to being touched all over with stuff and things. I think <laughs> I do that all day long. And I say it's my favorite quote because I'm taking Chrissy's class. And if, if a lot of people haven't, do it. I recommend it. I love it. And um, it's opened my eyes to a lot of different things um, down to how to hold the puppy's foot just to get them used to it. Are you grabbing onto that foot because you got to get it done? Well, like, or are like you acting? Or are you right? Like, or are you acting more so them. like? Uh, are you acting yeah. more so like your hand has fresh nail polish? So you want to grab them and be very gentle and and relaxed with them to show them um, that it's okay. You so want what, to remember that in the in the womb, all of us are tucked up tight. And so a puppy who's only eight, nine, 10 weeks old, only two months away from being in the womb, one of the worst things is to have arms and legs flailing. So you wanna hold them up. You know, it's the same thing, the same principle as grooming cats, only with cats, it's like this all their lives. They have to be held with legs closer to their body because if you let their arms and legs go akimbo into the air, they feel very insecure. But for puppies, when you are holding them, you always want to pull their limbs in. But I want to stress that the first developmental experience for every dog has to be what their primary sense is, and that's their sense of smell. You and I, as humans, we are visually, uh, our primary sense is our sight, and um, we are uh, we always orient that way. Dogs' primary sense, by far, is their sense of smell. So Absolutely. What, so here's the package. Here's my puppy package that we do. Uh, we can't this, even comprehend the way that they smell the world. It's you know? so much more than what we, we do. We don't have the biology to comprehend it. So we Thank have you so much, so, Olivia. Oh, so I don't see is, Olivia's so This comment. is really, um, really hmm. correct um, science uh, on this because I, I, I've taken several classes and I verified it with some other vets and trainers. And, and I've been a breeder for 40 years and I've had many, many puppies. The first thing I do with my puppy package, they have they are required 
to have four visits before 16 weeks. The first visit, the parent is required to stay. We, we do all of this in arrangement in advance. The parent is required to stay. It's only 15, 20 minutes. They come in early in the morning before the shop gets really busy, maybe 15 minutes before we open. And we turn the puppy loose in a locked shop and we just let them smell for about 10 minutes. We let them wander everywhere in the building and just smell. And we just kind of stand around and talk and they can hear our voices and know that we're there, us and mom. And then they smell everything. And once they have smelled every nook and cranny of the room, then we introduce them to sounds and experiences, holding the, dog, the, the puppy really close. We put them up on a table, but still keep our hands wrapped around them. Um, and then doing, uh, oh, sorry about my noisy dogs back there. Um, and then we do, we go into the drying room and with mom holding them completely like a baby, we'll turn on a dryer at a distance across the room so that they hear the sound. And we will actually go over to the tub. We do not bathe them. We just go over to the tub and we set them down in the tub without the water on and just praise them and love them and play kissy face and give treats, little itty bitty treats. And then we'll turn on the water, but away from them so that they hear the sound of the water and then pick them up and love on them again. And then um, go back to the table and touch them with all the stuff, the brush, the comb. Stuff and um, things. <laughs> and then I teach the parents, I don't even try to clip the nails the first time. I just pinch each toe. I take each toe and I handle each toe and say, look, I'm touching your toes. And each, each of that, you know, and then I tell the family to practice touching the feet, especially the front feet, touching each toe, just handling it regularly, make it loving, make it playful, make it normal. And um, don't, you know, don't yank on their legs. And then um, I also have them grab loose skin, like pretend this is a dog's loose skin and hair, and just kind of handle them like this, you know, and just kind of, you know, get them used to that sort of um, especially if they have, if they're a hair type dog, as opposed to a fur type dog, a dog that's going to get haircuts down the road, you want to definitely mm -hmm. kind of give them that feeling of, of being tugged on. And then we give them another treat and we send them home. And so that first visit, nice. they're coming with mom, they stay with mom and they leave with mom all within about 20 minutes. Now does, yeah. is this part of your four, you said you have uh, four visits? Four visits. Then the and that's part visit, of it? The oh, second visit. The Okay. The second visit, we do um, a bath from the neck back, not in the face. Okay. Because okay. yeah. we don't, because that's the part, getting that wet is really, so we build towards that. So we don't get a full bath until the third and fourth visits. We don't use high velocity dryers, but we let them listen to them. Mm -hmm. And we use little handhelds. And we won't do a full nail clip until maybe the third and third visit. And again, we're just barely tipping. It is, I cannot stress, extremely important that you never have a quicking incidence early on in a dog's life for the nails. Yeah. I don't care yeah. if the nails get razor, like you, you cannot risk quicking them. If you risk quicking them, um, you could ruin them for nail trims for life. So you just want all this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I will say, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't risk nicking a, a, a nail on a puppy or any dog who's worried about it, but um, you can bring them back from that. Yes. And part of why I'm saying that is because we have a lot of owners or a lot of owners that come to me because they're, they have a problem that we're like, he's been ruined. And then we know that we can never come back from that. Like you can come back from that. But yes. there are times where, you know, you're like, was I just getting greedy and trying to get a job done? The job with a puppy is the puppy's brain. It's what's happening between his ears Absolutely. and helping them feel confident. Everything that we should be doing in terms of socialization isn't just exposure. It's exposure that leaves the puppy thinking, I can handle that. Yeah. yeah. So if they're having trouble handling something that maybe another puppy thought was fine, it doesn't matter. This puppy needs to feel like they can handle it. Um, so there are a couple of things that and um, I usually, and one more thing, I usually in that first and second visit have my own personal dogs loose in the room and let them smell and interact with those other dogs too, but only my dogs, not with other clients. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and there are a couple of other things happening developmentally too. So at seven to eight weeks is the first fear imprint stage. 
So there are times where that's actually when puppies are leaving their mom and going to their new home. Yeah. Right there in the center of this, this phase where they're extra spooky. I uh, know, tech talk, extra spooky. But yeah. there are a couple of stages. There's seven to eight weeks and seven to eight months. We're not really sure why. There are some theories. And the theory that I think makes the most sense is that that's about the time when a puppy would be leaving the den and maybe not mom's not there. And anything that scares you at that point is something you're going to recoil from forever. And you can train away from that and you can help bring them back, but they are set and programmed to make lifelong opinions about anything scary during those ages. Yeah, it's called trauma imprint. And it happens yeah. to people too. Yes. It does. <laughs> it does. It does. Yeah. It does. And then um, at about, I can't tell you how often as a dog trainer, people are like, oh, we don't need to work on cum because he already knows that. I'm like, he's three months old. Next month, he won't know that unless you build it now and make him know it's valuable. Four months old, your puppy's like, well, I'm sniffing stuff. Aren't you needy? You know, <laughs> why do I need to go over back to you? And we need to see that as normal and not rebellious. Uh -huh. That's an incomplete message that the yeah. puppy hasn't figured out. Like, oh, you want to brush me? The puppy was just always kind of like, la, la, la. Sure, I'll let you do your thing. And then they hit about four months old and they're like, I want to explore. Why are you still brushing me? You know, right. we need to really capture it and help them understand that this is fun and this yep. has meaning and that and not to vilify them when they start getting a little bit more independent. Absolutely. You know? So um, important. So and another thing actually, and I want to say right. one other thing about the um, as we approach puberty, too, it's really important. I, I find that it's very important that we take time to educate parents about exactly what you're talking about, because they'll come in expecting to get their dog groomed, like already he's getting too long and too fuzzy. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. You cannot cut these this hair yet because it's not full hair. Puppy hair is equivalent to undercoat. Um, you know, all, all dogs, adult hair chefs have cute, well, people too, cuticle, medulla, cortex, right? The three layers of the hair. And the puppies only have two of those. And so their puppy hair is not fully formed. The adult hair, as you know, during coat change comes up from the underneath, but that is way down the road. We haven't gotten there yet. Well, it before they're so six months old, though. Not cut that. Yeah. Let Let it before grow. they're six months old, I've had owners say, I think he needs a bath. He's got this oily spot on his back. I'm like, no, that's the pixie saddle. That's where his adult coat is coming in. And it looks yeah. glossy and thicker. And yeah. the tail starts to bloom. So they get right behind the withers. They yep. get the coat change there and right mm -hmm. over the butt and the tip of the tail starts to bloom. Um, but some other things I think that groomers really need to be aware of is that um, when puppies are little, they're teething. And so one of the ways we can really set them up to have a better time, even when they're at home and mom's trying to pick eye boogies out, uh -huh. is to give that puppy something cold to chew on for 15 minutes before yep. you try doing stuff on their face. Yes. Because yeah. anytime you're like trying to, you know, and they're like, yeah. ah, and that reaction, I know sometimes we've been taught, because I was taught this way, hold on, he needs to learn. But we no. forget they're teething, that we've actually caused physical pain. Right. And we're mm -hmm. accidentally teaching them that this is horrid and mm -hmm. terrible. Right. But even just the, the forethought to give them something frozen to chew on for 15 minutes, even if they don't chew on it, they choose not to chew on it. I good. actually Maybe like their those. Feels good. These are things that you can get for human babies and you can, they work for dogs, which is you can get these teething rings that you, that have liquid in it and you can put mm. them in the freezer mm. and then let them, let them nom on it. And, and I have my puppy owners get um, some of the, the dollar store stuff, toys, mm -hmm. saturate them, put them in Ziploc bags in the freezer and, and always them. have one available. Yeah. That's yeah. a great idea. You can have like five of them in Ziplocs in your freezer, always have one ready and if the puppy wants to chew on something cold, it's there, but it's also not too hard. There's a texture mm -hmm. difference for a puppy. Mm -hmm. yeah. But often that's where puppies are learning to hate having their faces done. All those little shizus and lasus. Yeah, because that's teeth why hurt. I will not touch. <laughs> I will not touch a face in the sort of grooming training process in the four developmental visits until the third visit. Yeah. We leave the faces uh, until the third visit, until we've had a lot of good positive socialization and experience. And I find that, and I just want to stress again, that if you, the groomer or somebody in your shop a receptionist or whatever, will take the time to explain to the parents what you're doing and why, 
and what they're paying for. They're not going to pay for a dog that's going to come home looking different. When it's a puppy, what we are doing is we are training. And I like what you said. What we're working on is what's between the ears and not on, on their on their hair. Absolutely. Well, and when we talk um, to and, owners, and there Kim are a couple asking, things they can say. Kim yeah. is asking, do not trim puppy coat. If you're saying do not trim puppy coat. So uh, certainly not short, Kim, um, because the hair, um, so as, so remember cuticle medulla cortex, the three layers of the hair shaft as they're coming up, puppy hair only has two hairs. It's like, and it's really the equivalent. If you can think about it, like in a double coated dog, it's like undercoat. It's not fully formed hair. So if you start cutting on that, you're actually going to um, affect uh, the hair's process as the follicles are still forming. Remember, puppies are born less mature than human babies. Human babies um, usually uh, have their eyes open within that first day of their birth. They usually are able to um, to suck and, and to eat. Puppies and eliminate on born, their own. Their puppies eyes are that not yet. formed. Their ears mm -hmm. are not formed. They They are born blind, deaf, basically with a, a little bit of a lung and a mouth and a stomach and a poop. And they need help that, urinating. They need help defecating. They have yeah. to be they're, they're not quite to developed. Yeah. So puppies are born less developed. And there's a lot of physical development that happens in those early weeks that's extremely, extremely different than, um, that's why people, you know, having this discussion about, for example, docking tails at birth where, you know, you would cut, you know, if you have a breed that gets a docked tail, the, the argument about the cruelty of cropped ears is a very important one. I agree with that because that's done months later and it's a major surgery. But a dock tail is done on a dog at a time that they don't even have a central nervous system. Puppies are born without a central nervous system or and they don't feel, you know, there's it's it's just different. They're just a mouth and a stomach and some lungs and and the way to poop. And that's it. That's all they are. So um, in terms of Kim, your question about trimming puppy hair, um, it, you get towards six months, fine. Once you start to see the beginning of the adult hair coming in from underneath, you you know, but I would not trim a, a puppy that is prepubescent. No, I mean you can trim a little bit around their you know their eyes, and you can trim a little bit around the rectum, but you really need to let, especially along the torso, you need to let that hair mature, let those follicles form, uh, and and before you start doing haircuts on the bodies, you can you can get the hair out of their eyes. The shortest that I would go, Kim, would be well above uh, where the follicles are forming underneath. So, I mean, the only place I will touch any puppy of any kind. And remember, I used to, I, I've, I've bred poodles. I've bred, um, uh, I'm trying to think of my coated breeds, cocker spaniels. I've bred, um, you know, um, I've bred a lot of, of breeds of dogs. But um, the, the puppies, I will never touch anything except trimming a little around the, around the rectum, a little bit around the eyes, um, and 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 maybe you know if they if they get a little knot on their stomach or something. But I don't give haircuts until they're well four, five, six months old. And even at four months old, all I would do is just kind of a light tip off with scissors. Well, um, and these questions about doodles. So I would say that what what I usually try to do anyway is that that's a great time to have owners start understanding just how important brushing is and brushing mm -hmm. appointments are really valuable that yeah. if we if we aren't ready to do a full trim on this dog we could be teaching them about clippers we can be teaching them about the process mm -hmm. without actually doing the trimming and you know and I mean, I the average dog clippers, grows what mm -hmm. half an inch a month so by the mm -hmm. time they're six months old they might have three inches of coat it's not the end of the world it can be a lot for an owner to take care of but you know, we're also here encouraging them to get as many repetitions early. You know, it's not about waiting eight weeks till there's a need for grooming. We want them in because their brain needs to learn about what grooming is. So bringing them in for more frequent brushing actually serves its own purpose, <laughs> especially training our doodle owners. You know, they have an awful lot of coat and it's going to take 15 years worth of groomings so we can set their dog up for success and they won't have to worry about how are we going to brush him in the future? <laughs> so, so the Cam and Lisa and, and, and Sydney and so on, you guys are asking great questions. Um, there's not a blanket rule about when it's a good time to start, but remember 
the smaller the dog, the earlier the puberty is going to begin. Not necessarily always the same, but smaller dogs tend to have puberty starting five, six months. There are some breeds of dogs, for example, when you're hand stripping, if you're show breeding border terriers or Norwich terriers and you're doing hand stripping, they will not start that hand stripping process until the beginnings of puberty because they're pulling hair out and they're trying to create space for that adult hair to come in. So that's a good time to think about um, if it's a larger breed dog, I try not to do any cutting until after six months of age uh, mm. and just do bath, what I call a bath and tidy. I'll trim around the face. I'll trim around the sanitary areas. And keep in mind, these doodles often are a double coated dog. Most of the time. You know? yep. I mean, or they're very, a rarely, dog where yeah, they have very rarely do they have the coat and, coat that. Yep that you could, you know, that isn't going to have undercoat coming out and all that other stuff. Uh -huh. I mean, they, they have a complicated coat. Uh -huh. And um, I think more owners don't realize that when they get them, you know, so. Yeah. <laughs> Whoever um, thought it was a good idea to cross something that needs to shed <laughs> to something that won't let you shed. Like who thought that was a good idea? <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't make much sense. Yeah. So, um, Along with like the, the puppy stuff that we tend to do, you know, like the, the puppy visits and stuff, I think it's also important that we have in our head the kind of advice we can give our owners. So I have a couple of things that I tell all the owners. And um, if you listen to my podcast, I mentioned on my podcast a lot too, but. And what is the name of that podcast? No. <laughs> Creating great grooming dogs. Um, but um, all the things that they're doing with their puppy at this age, especially if it's around brushing, if it's around trying to get goop around his eyes, wiping his feet off when he has mud, everything should be trying to get this dog to be calm, comfortable, yep. and cooperative. Yep. That's the goal. And if we're working toward that goal, I think it's easier for people to assess, is this dog calm? Is this dog comfortable? Or is this dog cooperative? Versus, is he stressed? Is he scared? Is he anxious? People have trouble identifying that. Um, I think it actually takes more skill to identify, is he scared? You know, because that, there's always this sliding scale of, well, I don't think I was really scaring him. And it was only for a minute or two, you know, but is he comfortable? Oh, no, no. <laughs> you know, so teaching them about that so that they're not at home accidentally harassing their dog, thinking they're teaching grooming. Because a lot of owners go home and they're like, got to touch your feet. That's what they told us, <laughs> you know, and, and they're accidentally just tormenting their dogs. Um, and then the other one that I tell them to do is um, I want them to play a little game, just touching them with stuff and things. And I want them to sit at their coffee table and take random items off of their coffee table and just touch the dog all over with it. The jar yes. candle, the remote, the coaster, a pen. Yep. And owners will say, oh, I don't want him playing with those. I'm like, that's part of the lesson. I don't want him playing with those either because he can't play with our equipment. He can sniff it and we can touch him all over. And then work up to having them stand for that or maybe stand on the couch yep. beside them for that. But that early stuff has to be all thinking about what's going on in his, in his head, that this is safe, this is normal. And while they can't totally replicate the grooming process, a dog who has been touched all over with stuff and things and is used to standing for it and being like handled in that way, you get them on the table and that's just new stuff and things. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. and so they can help prepare their puppy for a better time. And also I tell them, I'm like, let go of the idea of brushing this week. I want you to do the stuff and things game for a week or two and yeah, then right. go back to brushing because we're we're booking you frequently enough that you're not you're not going to get matted. And he can he can learn from someone who knows how to brush instead of you and your puppy learning together, which is often a disaster. <laughs> right, right. So I really do try to find out. Owners. Yeah, exactly. And find out if they've had children, uh, if they've raised children, it's so much easier to have this conversation to remind them that, you know, an eight week, 10 week old, 12 week old puppy, they're very cute and everything, but they are really even less mature than babies. I mean, they've got, there is, there is such a different world and, and what they sense and the strong sense, the, the importance of letting them smell. Uh, we know uh, the science is telling us about eye contact and how dogs read our facial muscles. Mm -hmm. so you want to let them see your T-zones. And if you're masked, you want to take Soft, squinting off. eyes. Yeah. They, mm -hmm. they look for the muscles here that are going like that so that they can know that that's, that's a positive thing. So making eye contact mm -hmm. and, and smiling and saying their name 
And then, you know, I think it's also, I always try to begin by using a basic obedience commands that I'm going to continue stand. Oh, good dog. You know, say Fifi, you know, your little name. Good Fifi. Good job. Mm -hmm. Stand, you know, you stand, sit, stay, you know, and, yeah. and, and, and also encourage, oh. encourage all of our owners to find a good puppy class. Puppy classes yep. are a great way for puppies to learn some basic stuff while they're young and impressionable. Mm -hmm. uh, but you might find that it's a really good idea to meet some trainers and say, how do you guys do your puppy class? Um, trainers don't tend to know much about grooming. And I speak as a trainer. Yep. Groomers don't know much about training and trainers don't know much about grooming. So if we connect and say, this is some of the stuff I want them to know how to do by the time they get to their grooming appointment. And the other thing you should be telling trainers nearby is that trainers should be asking them at that first class, how was he at grooming? Word it that way so these owners know they're behind. If he hasn't been to a groomer yet and he's in a basic puppy class, he's behind already. Make sure they know that. You know, talk to trainers so that they're on side on the side with you. We're all in this together. We need right. to help these puppies get a good start. That is yep. such great information. And I want to um, respond to a couple of things in the in the chat room. First of all, Groomer Jen mm. thinks your podcast is great, Chrissy. So do I. Oh, thanks, Jen. Um, <laughs> oh, thanks. Kim is asking uh, for a recording of the puppy speech. And I don't know. Is, is that, <laughs> is that <laughs> at your class, Chrissy? I'm, I'm sure. Uh, no, probably. So, I could probably come up with a recording of the puppy speech. <laughs> it is, so I'm just saying we should have it for every owner who's waiting for their puppies to be picked up. This whole nice speech. Yeah. <laughs> we'll yeah, record this podcast should. for them. Now, yeah, I know. Right? I just have to respond to Groomer Jen, your, wonder, your comments um, about the new, so she says, my new doodle puppy owners confirm if I will do anal sac expression and ear plucking because their vet told them that their dog will need it done. Okay. So obviously, you know, we all, I, I, hopefully people are, are now aware of some of the problems that are emerging for our industry when we have old school thinking confronting new science and better information. Okay. And we've had a lot, I mean, I've been, you know, breeding and showing and grooming dogs for 40, 43 years now. I actually really have seen seismic changes in what we know. Yeah. what we understand. Yeah. I haven't so been quite important. as long as you, but yeah, absolutely. And every five years, there seems to be some new information that we have to assimilate to and say, okay, in yeah, light of new information. That was okay, but it's not. So yeah. the yeah. science is quite A lot of those clear. Are not okay. <laughs> we are not to express anal glands ever, never, never. And if there's a problem with them and we see a rupture or we see pus or we see hardness and redness, swelling, tenderness to the touch, we're sending it to the vet, okay? Because that's an internal organ with a veterinary problem. Groomers do not do anal sacs. Un end of discussion. That is yeah. a internal organ. And Dr. Cliff on down, everybody is saying to the grooming universe now, they found out that what groomers do yes, with squeezing indeed. actually breaks down the rectal wall muscle over time, mm -hmm. causing incontinence later in life. And you actually cause the gland to produce more by mm -hmm. squeezing it because it actually, you know, will fill up the empty sac that you've just drained. So it yeah. is actually really important that you gently, lovingly, politely, uh, without calling the vets old school, ill-informed old school thinkers, uh, which is what they are. Um, if they are teaching, that, <laughs> sorry, there, 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 there are people yeah. in every industry: lawyers, doctors, teachers. I was a teacher. I, I've seen this, where people who've been around it for decades do, and don't read up on current literature and don't follow the current journals and don't attend the conferences and don't read the new research. Uh, are still saying the same things that they've been saying for 40 and 50 years yeah, and they're wrong. Yeah. Right. So Jen and anybody else who has owners doing that, yeah. um, there are a couple and of ways to address ears it. Is same story. Yeah. Plucking ears is another thing that I, I don't pluck ears anymore. Um, no, but the way I address it with my owners is I'm like, the current research says that these are things that can cause more damage. So therefore my professional opinion is I am not going to do it. If there's a problem with the anal glands, the veterinarian goes in with a glove and they can palpate that. And they can also assess what comes out and decide if there needs to be a medication or a medical intervention. I cannot do that. If I'm plucking ears and there's any sort of an ear problem in there, 
I'm actually leaving little holes for for an infection to take hold. There's Whereas if the veterinarian does it, bacteria into the bloodstream, yeah, yeah because of that. Which, which if the veterinarian chooses to do it, they can also add whatever medications they feel is appropriate. Um, okay. And I and I have had to. I start off nice, take it nice and slow and easy, and then there's a little mm-hmm. bit of tough love. And tough love can also be ask your veterinarian to show you how. Seriously, it's not rocket science. When I was 14, mm-hmm. I was doing anal glands, plucking ears, trimming nails, and giving baths. So if an owner really in their heart of hearts thinks this is important, their veterinarian can show them how. Yes. So if we all, if they keep hearing from every groomer out there, actually, that's not my job. Yeah. You know, then Most that'll be a matter. Yeah. Um, uh, Grimmer oh, no. says she finds me. puppies oh. get PTSD because of rectal thermometers at the vet. Um, and that her goal is to keep the puppies calm while standing and lifting the tail. Yeah, I think we that's another thing that we should practice with lifting and handling tails. Uh, and again, just do it lovingly and minimally and gradually increasing as they mm-hmm. age because, you know, automatically... Mm-hmm puppies will sit down or all dogs will sit down when you lift the tail. So you want to train them that that is, that's just part of the sort of the playful yeah. handling and the touching. Well, the and that's part of it with adult dogs too. And uh, right. when we talk about tails, tails are part of the spine. So I want you to be thinking, even if I'm holding the tail up and the dog's pushing down, I'm the one in charge. I'm the one with the bigger brain. I can't let him do that. He's hurting himself. So I need to either guide a tail up or support from underneath. You know, and sometimes with a smaller dog, you can support underneath while you're doing whatever it is you got to do, you know, yes, but sure. but um, don't let them pull on their own tails because that's the scary yeah. part. It wasn't the mm-hmm. thermometer. It's it's being held. And that's true for right. nail trimming. Most of the time, it's mm-hmm. not the nail trimming. It's being held. Right. So, you know, when we talk about like standing and lifting and, you know, the thermometer, it might not be that the rectal thermometer was what scared them. It could be that mom and dad have been trying to clean their bummy off at home. Yeah, you know, and Although some of those things- thermometers make a beep, and you know, if a puppy's yeah. not used to a beep, that's pretty startling. Yeah, <laughs> and I actually have to say again, this is just about being an enlightened consumer. Veterinarians are business people, and we do, you know, we do have choices when we go out there. If mm-hmm. you have a veterinarian that is old school thinking, and the first thing they do in any situation with any age dog is go right to the four burly techs pinning the animal down, even though they haven't even started doing anything yet, they automatically, well, they say it's for safety and we're going to make sure that every single dog on every single procedure gets the four burly techs coming in and paralyzing the dog down on the metal table. That is not good for dogs. I think (laughs) it can go without saying. Well, and the waves of change are happening. Um, I don't know if I shared it with... The fear-free... Yeah, I was going to say, there was a, there was a pretty good article that, um, fear-free vets are talking about the results they're seeing from making that switch. So it changes in the air, which is awesome. It's been changing slowly but surely. Um, but, you know, sometimes so we have to remember. Chrissy, I love you. <laughs> the glass is half full. And if it's empty, I've got, I've got an empty glass to collect stuff if something comes along. But, right, right. Uh, but I think that if we, if we remember, too, owners will tell us all sorts of crap. <laughs> right? Oh, the vet told me that. And it's like, I know yeah. your vet. Your vet yeah. did not tell you that. I have the yeah. same vet. There's no way our vet mm-hmm. said those words to you. No way that our vet said yeah, most oh, he's owners not heavy. Get, you know? Most owners um, get onto yeah. social media and then they hear unbelievable oh, crap yeah. from other people in social yeah. media yeah. about what or you they hear do. like the vet yeah. hears stuff like, oh, the groomer said or the groomer wouldn't do, and it's like, oh. We, we've got to stop just blanket believing our owners because, yeah, yeah. because what are they going to do? Like, oh, well, I did that wrong. But let's say the groomer did it. Right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, but, you know, honestly, our consumers don't know what they're looking for. So right. spending time with them, with their new puppy and explaining that, like, your puppy will have grooming needs their entire life. When your Mm -hmm. puppy is old and and doesn't have good health anymore and is sore from arthritis, if we teach them to trust us now, they will trust us forever. And that's not going to change throughout their life. I actually uh, do forecast for them, depending on if it's a larger breed dog, um, fur versus hair, and I'll get to that in a second. But I really want to stress very early on a couple things that most people don't know, which is that if you don't keep the toenails shorter for the life, if they're actually 
walking on a bent foot because the nails are so long, as opposed to they are walking on a flat, you know, the pads. If, they, if their nails are so long that it's throwing the bones off, then that means that they're going to, it's like a woman walking on four inch high heels eight hours a day, six days a week. Uh, she's going to have back problems uh, right. because yeah. throwing off your whole spinal alignment. You, you, ladies, you do know that high heels yeah. are bad for you, but that's oh, okay. Another whole, another conversation. Another whole conversation. You know, arch supports are bad for you too. As right? a natural barefoot yeah. walker. Yeah. Yeah. You're not <laughs> anyway. to those, yes, I know. They're, they you are. Know, the nail health, um, are really bad. I, I, as part of my, you know, talking to any new owner, because sometimes, uh, especially up here in New England, we don't have an unwanted puppy population. So puppies are coming up from rescues or you're getting them from a breeder. Many of our dogs are coming from rescue. So they're mm -hmm. getting dogs that are a little bit older, but they're, they're new dog owners. But the the, I tell everybody the weight of your dog's body should be on the pads of their feet. So right. if their nails get too long, their toes either have to stretch out or curl. And that goes all the way up, up their leg. Yeah. You know, and, and it causes. And by the time problems. that a, a large breed dog like yeah. Labrador or larger is, you know, seven, eight years old, the dog is walking in so much pain because it's got arthritis. So you're, I also you're, show them a video of a two minute nail trim. I'm like, this right. is, this is not an issue. I think owners have this idea that dogs hate having their nails trimmed. Oh, yeah. And mm -hmm. having having a couple of videos for people, keep in mind that if you've never owned a dog, you might think that black gunk comes out of their ears because that's your sample size. One dog who has black gunk, you know, like that they don't know. So if we show them like this is a normal nail trim, this mm -hmm. is what a healthy ear looks like yes. um, and just be very be smart. part of their early education and people reminding them smart. that. 15 years. Where are you going to be in 2037? Yeah. <laughs> 2037 right. is horrifying, isn't it? Yeah, it is. <laughs> right? Yeah. Sheds shivers on my spine. But every time I see a puppy, I've got that 15 year calculator going. Like, yeah. where are you going to be? You mm -hmm. know, um, this is a long time. Yeah. They don't think of 15 years necessarily as a long time until you call it 2037. Yeah, <laughs> that is true. It is. Because that's it like is. flying cars, right? <laughs> Future. So it is. So I hope people have, have heard in this discussion that puppies are not the groom. The focus is not cutting their hair and styling them. It is not your first um, couple of months with a dog is got to be training mm -hmm. and um, you've and training the owner as well as. Um, but I, I do want to say one other thing that I think is really important to educate people about. And everybody knows I'm sort of, you know, I'm the coat types queen. And I've come up with this list of 15 coat types to kind of yeah, help standardize, <laughs> standardize grooming terminology. I do try to tell people right off the bat what their dogs based on the breed. And if it's, you know, sometimes you don't really know if it's a mixed breed yet, what's going to happen. But you can always tell from birth if it's well, not from birth, but you know, if you if you had a very very young puppy, you could always tell if it's fur or hair, and um, or uh, more genetically correct to call it undetermined mm -hmm. length UDL, which is hair. It grows and grows and grows until you cut it, or it breaks, or PDL, predetermined length genetically, where it's going to grow to a certain length and stop. So you're looking at the main part of the body and you're going to be talking to them, educating them not only about these training techniques that we've been talking about and the whole developmental experience and how grooming, but, but what their grooming life is. And again, forecasting for that 15 years ahead, is this a fur type dog who's primarily going to be a shedder and certain times of the year uh, between the uh, solstice, between the daylight savings time change and the solstice, both in the spring and in the fall, those are the times of major shedding in the spring, um, the springtime, and mm -hmm. a minor shedding um, in the late fall. Um, these are scientifically proven. You can predict this. If it's a fur type dog and it's going to grow to a certain length and stop, it's going to be a shedder. You're going to talk to them about the tools that go with that, the behaviors that go with that, the expectations, what it's going to be like around their house, what the grooming schedule should be, what they should and should not be doing at home. And it's triggered by the amount of daylight, not the temperature around you. Mm -hmm. Yes, owners are expected to not hear shedding. Yeah, you it's know? not. It's not yeah. based on the hot or cold. It's based on mm -hmm. how long the light is. So yep. starting, I always mm -hmm. tell people as soon as you do the spring forward in the spring and the daylight savings time starts, and then you're going all the way to 
basically the end of June for, um, uh, or, you know, 4th of July is a good marker um, for the um, summer solstice, uh, which is June 22nd, June 23rd. So you actually have a very easy mark to say, look, these are your big shedding times. And then you can book around that. But you also mm -hmm. want to explain to people right off the bat, you know, if you, I always tell people in case you ever move or you, you don't come to me as knowledgeable of a groomer, if you go anywhere else, please make sure that they don't shave this kind of coat. And it, and I show them charts. I have my 15 coat types poster up in the lobby. I also show them pictures of double coat and undercoat and what it looks like and what, and how you have to tell people um, if you ever go to a different groomer, this is a coat you cannot shave or clip or ever. This is a de shedding coat. And then this one over here, if it's a hair type dog, it is going to need to be trimmed or, or uh, you know, in certain ways. And then you have to talk to them the whole different conversation about puberty, the intense matting and tangling. Oh, thank you for putting your little blurbs in there. Something changed. Right. You go technically, Kim, Lori. Kim mentions she so much information in large words. I guess I have another class to take. You know what? I love taking more classes. Class oh, after absolutely. Class after, class after class. I just can't get enough classes. Me too. And, I'm an and now student. I'm so behind on my classes. I have um, I have a whole dog conference I need to catch up on, the lemonade conference. And uh, yeah, <laughs> but I'll get there. I'm behind. Yes, but, yes. <laughs> but classes, yeah, classes are just so awesome. Never and stop educating. education opportunities like this, like ask your mm -hmm. questions, you know? Right, um, right. Ask us questions. Give us ideas for topics too. I think we're all set up until like September for topics, but you know. Yeah. Um, but this is this development. Yeah. We're going to spend the whole month, right, mm -hmm. on yeah. development. And yeah. you know, we've been focusing on puppies tonight, and we are kind of at at the end of our time. But um, yeah, and it's so yeah. important developmental stage. I can't express that enough. And a lot yeah. of the times, yeah. people's dogs on my table, and they don't understand mm -hmm. how why is she so good for you. And it's like, well, I started very young yeah. and I didn't force anything. I went nice and slow and let her and let her uh, figure it out or, or him. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and they, they yeah. gained their trust yeah. because once you get that bond with that new puppy, it's the best experience to have because they just trust yeah. you and they're like, you know what? You're my person for the next hour to do. You for the know, next 15 years. Well, or yes, more. yes, for the next lucky. 15 years. Yeah. I started oh. with clients. It's the I'm amount of dogs, dogs I've had their whole life. They're 90 oh. to 300 times in their lifespan. So yeah. we need to create a connection. Yeah. So true. Hey, Crystal, mm -hmm. I see you. If, if she said, ah, classes spent all day trying to decide what classes to take it in her room and got nowhere. <laughs> take my encyclopedia <laughs> of dogs class. It is amazing. It's amazing. Uh. And yeah. the PGC exam, I, I'm really looking yeah. forward to take the PGC exam. Oh, I, I took just, it um, and I got, I, and I passed and I got my certificate. It's awesome. really nice. They I send you, you said that, yeah. Beautiful. They give you this window, a uh, very large, very nice, high quality. It's not a thin little window sticker. It's a high quality window decal that nice. is really nice. Plus you get your, your certificate and you get a patch that you can sew on a jacket or a smock, which is super, super nice. I'm, nice. I love that. Nice. Um, but anyway, Crystal, I hope you will um, take the Encyclopedia of Dogs class. It is really awesome. And then are we going to kind of get into puberty next time? Adolescence is next time. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And I'm excited about that one. Um, even just today, I saw somebody posting about like, as a puppy, this dog was doing great. And now I don't know what's happening. And it's such a common thing because they hit adolescence and we start thinking they're adults and they're, they're different. Not. They're a different oh, level of puppy. Teenagers. Yeah. Well, and we vilify that and we shouldn't. They're, they're a different level of puppy, you know? And, there's and, and again, so many on. parallels to human adolescent psychology. It is yes. a fascinating. That was my area of my major area because I was a high school teacher. Yeah. That was my major area of study is adolescent psychology. And the parallels are, um, are, are really so, so, so perfect. And it's, I, I'm just going to give you one little hint as we look forward to next week uh, when we cover it. If you've ever driven a stick shift car, and most people have not these days, let's face it, they're I tiny. only drive <laughs> stick shift until the but if you've I have ever driven, if you've ever tried to do a clutch <laughs> and um, like putting the car into first gear and lifting off the clutch and accelerating 
at the same space as the same pace as you're letting up on the clutch. That is exactly what adolescence is. It is that balancing between what you're letting go and what you're put, you know, moving forward with. And it, you have to do it at this sort of even, you know, it's, it's. Yeah. And maybe it's the adolescent in me. I like adolescent dogs. I think they're fun. But you yeah. have to know what to expect and not take it personally when they can't handle stuff. Right. So that's coming next week. And I think there's yeah. a lot of fun stuff in there. Um, but um, we got some really good questions today. That's good. Oh, I'm talking yeah. about classes and stuff. You know what? The school offers a bunch of classes. There are lots of educational opportunities out there. And um, I am really proud of our industry that so many people are taking classes, you know, yes. and that so many people are teaching them. You know, I there's just so the much neat the stuff out there. That is, you know, the pandemic has been horrible in so many ways, but for our industry, as a historian, myself, as, as a, as, you know, I'm a historian, that's what I, that's my professional training. I look at the big picture changes, especially having been in grooming for four decades. The pandemic has changed this industry, absolutely transformed it because it has made education accessible for everybody. Yes. Because yeah. we didn't have yeah. online grooming conferences prior to two years ago. It's hard to believe, right? That really Although prior I to two say, years ago. There were podcasts. You, <laughs> yeah, I mean, Barbara Bird and, and Susie Scott have been doing theirs for five. Mine's been up for high, three. High you know, free that's information. Not really interactive. And and of course, you know, you've got Mary Aquendo who's been doing amazing yeah. positive education. Yes. But, but there was not a lot of that. There was not a no. lot of choices. No. And now groomer education is accessible everywhere to everybody. And it is so permanently transfiguring our industry. And I'm just thrilled about it. Oh, uh, thank you, Groomer Jen, that you like our show. And I think thank I owe you, you a phone call. I think I forgot to like, follow up with that, Groomer Jen. Brought anything <laughs> for a life that was finding us. That's so great. The opportunity to oh, learn from good. us. Uh, um, well, back at you, Groomer Jen. Thank you. Thank Fan you. girl and right back at you. Well, I would say Boy, you is, did a great job. Uh, well, you. you know, I, I changed the logo towards the end, but I figured it out. <laughs> so uh, this is the part where I believe I think I figured out how to get the end credits. Uh, <laughs> you unplug lovely. it at the wall. Is that? Yeah, I got it. it. And now I can see the counting. So now next time, Jen, we can do our little dance before it starts. Okay. I like to dance to the music. Um, so I believe this is going to be the uh, the thank yous with the pet pros. And um, it's always nice to see you ladies. Thank you for joining. Um, you, and I'm thank looking you, forward to next uh, Monday as usual. And I will be there. Thank you so much, everyone who was interacting with us. And again, Bye, you can... Uh, you can see Chrissy and Jen with multiple classes. We're all available um, for any questions that you may have. We are always looking to educate and better educate um, ourselves as well. Thank you very much. And we will see you soon. Thanks, Lori. Bye. Bye, everybody. <laughs>